I was born in Toronto. Uh, I'm the eldest of seven children. Uh, so grew up in a blue collar uh, environment. My father uh, was a uh, master carpenter uh, in Ireland. My mother was a seamstress. Uh, when they moved to Canada, the work dried up in the winter, the very first winter they, uh, they encountered. He went to, uh, into the army, actually, for a few years, uh, but was getting posted hither and thither. And uh, I think ultimately they, they decided that that mobile life, especially when it was suggested that he might have to go to Germany, uh, was not for them. So he left and uh, joined the, the police, where he spent 32 and a half years. I had just graduated with a degree in philosophy, and I thought that the law was a good mesh. Uh, it allowed me to uh, pursue my desire to contribute to the development of uh, a just society. Just society was a bit of a buzzword back then, and I was motivated by that. I thought that having witnessed I heard a lot about uh, the type of society that my parents grew up in in Ireland where your prospects were largely determined by your economic station or the economic station of your parents. I wanted very much to contribute towards the type of level playing field and uh, just society in which somebody could not only dream but could actually have a realistic shot at achieving their dreams. What goals do I have for the court? What challenges are there out there? Certainly one challenge is to uh, maintain the public's confidence in the court. Uh, obviously this is something that all courts face. Uh, for me it's very important that every litigant who comes to our court feels that they had a fair hearing by an impartial judge who heard their submissions, reached a fair decision based in law. So this is something that uh, is important to me going forward, that we always bend over backwards to make sure that parties, both parties, feel that they got their fair day in court before an impartial arbiter. I think keeping pace with technology is a challenge. Uh, we, we're again going to bend over backwards to do that. I think it's important. I think attracting, continuing to attract highly qualified people to the court, uh, to have a, uh, a court that reflects the uh, cultural diversity of the country and that has more of a gender balance than we have right now will be a challenge. It's something that I'm going to work hard to try and achieve. On diversity, other than Justice Mandeman, I don't think we really have a whole lot of, uh, well, we don't have any people of color, for example, on the court, and that's something that we need to work on. Uh, the gender balance, uh, many of our recent appointments, uh, well, we, we just had Justice uh, Mary Gleason, uh, and maybe last year Justice Bedard, but other than, uh, other than those two colleagues, most of our recent recruits have been males, as we have seen some of our uh, more senior female judges go to the Court of Appeal or retire. And so uh, we, need, we need to achieve a better balance. Obviously, it's, 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 it's the minister's decision who to appoint. Uh, what we want to do is attract, uh, encourage candidates, qualified people from around the country to put their uh, applications in and to feel free to talk to us uh, about what life at the court and our, our work is all about. State of our resources, well, I can say we, we've been down uh, two or three judges for some time, so we are, we are anxiously awaiting replacements as a result of uh, being down three judges now and some illnesses that we had. We are a little bit behind, actually maybe more than a little bit behind in terms of our internal benchmarks uh, for how quickly we try to get matters on. So yes, uh, we, we could use uh, as soon as possible uh, those uh, replacements. 
Um, I think that it's fair to say, based on everything that I've seen so far, and I'm still looking at, at the data, but everything that I've seen so far suggests to me that we are also uh, in need of at least one, if not two, additional prothonotaries. Our prothonotaries are all uh, maxed out, uh, extremely hard-working people, and they, they carry a very important uh, part of our overall workload, particularly in the case management area. And as case management has taken on increased importance in recent years, um, uh, we find that they have become overburdened. And uh, for us to continue to be able to uh, deliver uh, justice on a timely basis, uh, we, I think it's fair to say, need another one or two prothonotaries. Proposals that the federal court be abolished. I, I'm aware that that idea was kicking around back in the 90s. I hadn't heard that it had been revived. Uh, if it has, I can tell you that I can't do any better than what Justice Yakabuchi did uh, back at that time at, uh, on the occasion of the 25th anniversary of the court in 1996 uh, when he said that the, the importance of the federal court uh, was as great as ever. And we have a proliferation of uh, an ongoing proliferation of federal statutes, um, uh, growth, high growth in the uh, rate of judicial reviews from federal boards, commissions, and tribunals across the country. And the federal court is absolutely the right place for those types of proceedings to be heard. And obviously, if they were uh, heard across the country in different courts, that would not do anything for the coherence of the body of law that, that this court has been developing in many areas of federal jurisdiction. Uh, the whole area of federal administrative law would be obviously uh, somewhat undermined, I think, the development of that area if uh, it were being developed in 10 different provincial courts. Would it be in the interest of the administration of justice to move our national security work under Section 38 of the Evidence Act into the provincial courts? Personally, I don't think so. Uh, first of all, the information that we're talking about here is ultra-sensitive information. Having worked with very, very sensitive commercial transactions, for example, it might be public market bids that haven't yet been launched, or other highly confidential bids, or even uh, cartel investigations where you know, somebody has become an immunity applicant, and there's a high degree of confidentiality associated with that ho whole process until the time at which the authorities start to pursue the uh, co-conspirators. Having been uh, intimately involved in a number of these cases, I know only too well that as you expand the group of persons, the class of persons who are privy to sensitive information, you increase the risk of a leak. And in this area, we can't afford the risk of a leak. Not only would it compromise the confidentiality of the information itself. It would compromise the safety of our human sources. It would also, uh, to my mind, not make a lot of economic sense to duplicate the, um, uh, the cost, the significant cost associated with uh, building, for example, the bunker that we have for our national security work in every single province. So. Uh, I do have concerns that uh, this would not be in the administration of justice. I don't think it would be. I don't think it would make economic sense. I don't think it would be in the interest of our international reputation uh, if we ever did start to uh, compromise this type of information. I think we'd stop receiving as much as we do today. So it's a serious issue. Uh, I'm not aware of any. Uh, cases in which this court's involvement has led to delays. I think the delays, anybody familiar with the facts would uh, readily acknowledge that the delays have, uh, would have in any event occurred because of constitutional challenges, whether they were in the provincial courts or in our court, or uh, were attributable to factors outside of this court's control. Uh, we have expertise in this court that doesn't exist in other courts. We have a group of people who do this stuff all the time and have strong backgrounds in this area. 
uh, I find it hard to believe how uh, the provincial courts that don't have that expertise and, and that wouldn't have the critical mass of cases that we have to continue to maintain it and build it could do this work as quickly as and efficiently and effectively as the people who are our designated judges do it. Any misconceptions uh, on the part of the public, not so much. On the part of the, the, the bar, that's a good question. I don't think there are any serious misconceptions. Every once in a while you hear somebody quip that uh, the federal court uh, is a government court. <laughs> and all I can do is tell you that <laughs> certainly those uh, colleagues of mine who've joined the court from the public, uh, from, from the, the, the public sector <laughs> have a very different view and certainly don't feel that way. Uh, I think maybe practitioners also, some practitioners who are more familiar with the uh, provincial rules of practice may find our rules less familiar, maybe less user-friendly. We have a rules committee headed by Justice Hughes that is looking at revamping our rules to make them more user-friendly. What drew me to competition law? It was just by chance. I had been wrestling during my law articles with how to use the skills I acquired during my MBA. I did a joint MBA law degree and I hadn't been achieving much success when I was asked to work on the very last criminal merger case under the old Combines Investigation Act and Eureka. I found that area of the law where I could bring my MBA skills to bear with my legal skills in an area that uh, was, was somewhat of a hybrid. It was also a hybrid between corporate and litigation, and I was wrestling at that time b between corporate and litigation. Career highlights generally have been in the area of public service. So I spent the first four years uh, of my life as a lawyer at the Competition Bureau and that was just a wonderful experience. I was able to work on all of the best files uh, across the country because I was uh, the special advisor to the commissioner of competition. Uh, I um, was also able to work on uh, or cherry pick the best policy issues as well. So that was just a, a wonderful experience and also feel like I was waking up every morning and, and having an opportunity to uh, make a contribution, to make a difference. Uh, the other highlight was at the OECD, again, in a public service, this time an international public service uh, capacity where I was head of outreach in the competition division. So I was responsible for the OECD's work with developing countries and former Soviet countries, uh, assisting them to transition to market-based economies. Uh, in private practice, highlights would have been uh, uh, working on some of the mega deals of the 90s. I, Think back to, uh, for example, the two rail deals or uh, Onyx's attempt to put the two airlines together. Those were certainly highlights. I learned a lot uh, in those deals. Uh, after I came back from France, I had the good fortune to uh, work on some, uh, again, top shelf deals uh, at Osler, where just take one year at 2008, uh, working on Telus's uh, heading the competition team that worked on TELUS's um, potential bid for uh, Bell, which didn't ultimately go ahead, but also JRI's uh, White Knight bid for uh, Agricor and the uh, significant uh, work then that we had to do with the Competition Bureau on the divestures when, uh, when uh, Saskatchewan Wheat Pools and JRI uh, wound up uh, each getting certain assets, uh, certain uh, grain terminals and other assets uh, of, of AgriCorps. What drew me to the federal court? I had two kids who had just gone off to university. My third was in uh, the last year of high school. My spouse was just ramping up to go back into the workforce uh, and was amenable to returning to Ottawa, which is her hometown. So it was a really good opportunity to, the time was right, uh, to return to public service. I was in a position where I could make the financial sacrifice and I was more than happy to do it. I wanted to make a, a, a contribution. I get a, a much more, I find it much more rewarding to uh, be able to serve the public, uh, to be able to do exactly uh, what you think is in the public interest. 
um, at any given time on, on, on your files? I would say to a young person that they follow their passion first and foremost. One can be a better law, a better lawyer when one is in an area that they feel passionate about. I talk to uh, as many young, young people as I can uh, who are either in law school or thinking about law school and I always uh, encourage them to think about uh, public service. Public service can be very, very rewarding, uh, whether like, uh, like I did, uh, it's in the area of uh, competition law, whether it's in the Crown Prosecutor's Office, whether it's working uh, in a department such as the Environmental Department or Trade, can be extremely rewarding. Uh, so I encourage young people to think about uh, what interests them and then find an area of the law that meshes with that. Uh, because if, if they're in an area that interests them, well, as Confucius said, if you find something you like to do, you'll never have to work a day in your life. And uh, they can get up in the morning, bounce out of bed, feel good about what they do, and if they're passionate about what, they'll, what they do, they'll be better at it and more creative uh, and make more of a contribution.